Successful re-entry after hospitalization requires a few different things to be in place. Um, no, one, number one, we have to have student motivation. Students have to be motivated to get better and motivated to come back to school or else they're going to be much, much, much more likely to just drop out. Ideally, we really want to have parent involvement in this process, parent inv involvement in planning, and, and for that matter, we want to have an opportunity to plan um, that student coming back before they just show up again at the door. So um, a plan should be in place ideally in every school, every school district, for re-entry for transitioning students back after inpatient care. And so we should sit down ahead of time and we should say, you know, we're going to have some students and they're going to be transitioning back after some inpatient care and here's what we should do. We should identify a re-entry person in each district. And that re-entry person is the one kind of go-to person, and, and maybe it could even be per building, right? An identified re-entry person who communicates with staff, with family, with school personnel. They're the ones who are gonna be getting the necessary releases of information. You guys know about that, right? So in order for us to talk to the hospital, um, for the hospital to talk to us, um, for the family to talk to everybody, I suppose, for, for all the parties to be on the same page, we wanna have good communication and that requires releases of information. If we have one designated person to do that, it smooths the process. Um, we also wanna have a support person. Um, so the plans that have been most successful at doing this well, and they demonstrate that, by the way, um, in terms of the data of, of successful retention after these events, right? These are kids that don't drop out, that don't get rehospitalized, that successfully transition back to school and finish their program of study. Those programs have these things in place. Um, a support person. And that's a designated person who's going to be of support to that student. It can be the reentry person, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a certain designated teacher or support staff or anyone. Um, but that person is identified to be the support person for the student reentering. Kids go from being hospitalized, often not having any academics, although some, some hospitals will try to keep them having access to their um, educational materials. For the most part, they don't. So when they are thrown back into the educational environment, still vulnerable, still likely in distress, still dealing with kind of the acute features of this, um, it can often be beneficial to start partial days first, right? Don't just throw them back in. We start, we start partial days, we identify what they most need to do, and then we build up from there as their coping strategy comes back online. I see. <clears throat> when we get kids back into our school system is the parent doesn't want them at home. Right. I already missed five days of work when he was in the hospital and... Yeah, and yeah. you guys are structured, you take them. Right. And so, the, you know, that's where the communication is really important. And so the, so the parents understand it isn't that we don't want the child here. It isn't that we're trying to pawn them off on you at home. It's that we feel like they're going to be most successful if we ease them back in. Um, and so that, just that team, you know, um, mentality and, and is, is super important because I know you're right. Well, and, and maybe I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but it seems by the time the child, I'm thinking especially about addictions or driven to suicide, is the, the family, they've had it by the time the kid goes into treatment right. or whatever. And, you know, one more time and they only have one more chance and they're out of our home type of attitude. And it doesn't matter how much you talk and try to tell them and try to make sense that this strategy will work, you know, but to plant him back into a high stressful situation is not helpful. In his best interest, right. Yeah, and, right. and they still don't want to listen, so. Yeah, that is unfortunate. And we just do the best we can and without you know, without parents being fully on board, then if the students are, are, are going to need to be there full time, then maybe we find other ways to reduce the stress. So maybe part of the day they're in uh, a less overwhelming environment um, where they're, they can do their work more one-on-one -on -one, and then the other half of the day they're back in the normal classroom setting. So maybe we find ways to accommodate, you know, to kind of approximate that. I'm glad you said that because that's kind of what I've been 
I have a lot of kids with anger issues and stuff, mm -hmm. and I'll just say, if, if it gets too tough in the classroom, just excuse yourself to the bathroom. Come, I have two rooms in my office. Come sit in my back room. You don't have to talk to me. Right. If you want to yell and scream in my back room, it's kind of soundproof. It doesn't matter. You just know? make sure their work comes with them, otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> I do. And, and then I also let the teacher know that the child is with me. Yep. Because... A lot of times they don't want to say, yeah, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to go for its office. Right. <laughs> so it's just an exit strategy that allows them to access that. Well, and in, yes. Sometimes we're not notified that kids are coming back or that they've even been hospitalized. Oh, yeah. And this is, yeah, and this is where, um, and, and that's why I think when I said these need to really be district-wide uh, changes that happen, is kind of figuring out ways um, to, Put that plan in place and so when a student is absent we tend to know we tend to know that they're absent at least right and so then um you know contact might be made to the family to see if it's an excused absence or an unexcused absence and um and so in instances where we find out that they're hospitalized then right away we have to start the process of getting release of information because before we can blink they're going to be back at school again and we haven't necessarily been properly notified so it's a hit and miss proposition without really good communication from the beginning and the problem is i mean we could say we would like you know, anytime a student from our district is, I mean, we could work um, at it from a school district to a hospital uh, status. So we, we say, um, here would be our preference to be most helpful to our students. We know we got HIPAA and everything we have to work around, but if you could, every time a student of our district is hospitalized, if you could approach the family about a release of information and see if they are open to a release of information, so that we can help the students more transition back, we would appreciate it. There's still gonna be those cases where the hospital is gonna to say to the family, um, would you like to sign a release, a release of information so we can communicate with your child's school to facilitate transition? And they're gonna say, hell no. But you also have other cases where it maybe didn't even occur to the family um, that you would need that information and that will help facilitate it. No, and that's why the plan really ideally needs to be in place before, and then we just tailor it to that student. So that we already have the plan. We have a designated um, person. We have a designated procedure we follow, and we just need to activate it when we get that information. And if we get that information, you know, eight hours before the student returns back to us, or four hours, or two hours, we activate it to the best of our ability at that time. Because when we're trying to make up a plan, <laughs> You know, which is what most of us, most of our districts have to do now because we don't, most of our districts don't have a plan, in mine included. Um, so, so we're trying to make it up as we go along and it's not going to be very effective. So, yeah. last minute. Almost like, almost all of us have crisis plans. Right. In place. So it'd be an element of that. Right, right. That have gone through that. I mean, that would be a simplified way of looking at it. Exactly. So you have this sheet that tells you the steps to follow and you fill in the blanks. Absolutely. Makes sense. Um, the other thing that we, so, so a lot of that is um, things that we have to approach more from a, a system level. But, but as individual instructors and individual staff, we also need to think that accommodations for temporary reduced functioning are probably going to be needed for many of these kids, either because they're still in crisis and they're returning to us still in the midst of that, because they've only been gone, in many cases, one or two days, but also because many of them might be returning on new medications. Um, they may have side effects. They may have, um, you know, cognitive slowing or sleepiness or some other kind of, of medication effect, um, even aside from just the poor concentration and focus due to whatever the exacerbated condition was anyway, the depression or the anxiety or whatever. Um, and, of course, empathy is important, just like we keep coming back to this, that when students are in this level of distress, um, we need to be uh, understanding of that. We need to have empathy for what they're going through so that we can find ways to reach them and then find ways to accommodate and make them successful in that transition back.